And so as many of you might know, this is part of a series for this semester. We had a lot of great hires this year, and Stallion was uh, one of them. And if you remember, we had like a big party. Um, so Stellian is wrapping up this series within this RI seminar series. So uh, Stellian, um, before coming to CMU, he was at Disney there. He um, was doing a lot of cool stuff there. He graduated um, University of British Columbia. And where, uh, as a PhD student, he is working on animation, and especially uh, physics. Uh, based simulation, um, physics based animation. Um, today, as the title suggests, he's going to be talking about making things. Um, but I, I, I've heard Stellian's talk a couple of times. I don't think I know very many people working on what he's working on. Uh, it's very cutting edge, um, fabricating um, uh, these like gross little robots that you'll see. Um, <laughs> But I think you'll really enjoy it. So thank you very much for presenting. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for coming to my talk. Um, my work lies at the intersection of computer graphics, robotics, and computational design and digital fabrication. Um, and I'll, I'll start talking a little bit about computer graphics, and in particular, the reason why I've always found computer graphics to be so compelling is that virtual environments like the ones we see in today's movies and video games allow us to create anything we dream up. They really place no bounds on our imaginations. Um, and nowadays, 3D printing uh, allows us to create tangible links to these digital um, environments. So it is bringing the same type of freedom to the real world, which I think is very exciting. Now, just for um, those that might not be familiar with 3D printing, it is a process that starts with a digital object. This digital object uh, gets split into very thin layers. And each layer gets uh, fabricated independently of the other ones in a process that conceptually is very similar to traditional printing processes. The exact approach for creating the individual layers varies depending on the te technology that is used. In this case, um, there is plastic that gets melted and extruded into very thin strands that get deposited. So it's kind of like you're drawing with a, uh, a thin strand of plastic. And as the plastic then hits previous layers of the material, it, uh, it fuses and it gives rise to um, physical three-dimensional objects. So roughly speaking, that's how it works. And over the past few years, uh, 3D printing has been generating quite a bit of buzz. And I think it's important to take a look at why this is. Um, first of all, 3D printing is changing the way we make things. For the first time in history, it doesn't cost more, it doesn't take longer, and it's not more difficult to create a complex design than a simple one. Um, this has a lot of different applications, but just to give a concrete example, this device on the right is a 3D printed fuel nozzle. It was approved by the FFA for use in uh, airplanes, and it replaces a part that with traditional methods used to be made from 20 different components that had to be assembled together. And this 3D printed part is faster and cheaper to make, and it is lighter and more durable. Right? So lots of advantages. The range of materials for 3D printing is constantly growing, uh, which is also very exciting. Um, and so now, with existing technologies, we can create objects that are composed of different materials. This is an example. It was 3D printed in one piece. And the white parts are made from a rigid material, and the transparent one is a rubbery soft material. Right? And again, it was 3D printed in one piece. Um, 3D printing also has the potential to lead from mass production to personalized design and fabrication, which for many application domains is very important. This is an example. No two people are alike, and therefore no two prosthetic devices should be the same either. They should really be uh, created specifically for the characteristics and needs of, dif of different users. And right now, 3D printing is the best option for creating one-offs, right, or products that need to be made in a, in a very small quantity, or perhaps only one, um, one prototype. And last but not least, 3D printing is empowering new designers. Um, 3D printing is becoming increasingly more affordable and accessible, and that means that the general public now has the means to create whatever objects they can imagine, which is, a, um, again, very exciting. So all these traits, I think, make 3D printing a really cool and interesting technology. Um, and I'm particularly excited about applications of 3D printing to robotics. 
I think it's easy to imagine that in the not so distant future, there are going to be, there, there are going to be um, a, a rich ecosystem of robotic devices that will uh, be part of our daily lives and they will fundamentally change the, word, the way in which we work, learn, and play. Um, and many of these devices will have to be customized or personalized according to different tasks that they need to perform or according to the individual needs and preferences of their users. I think 3D printing will play an important role in how we fabricate these devices, but another important question is how are we going to design them? How are we going to create the blueprints for fabrication, especially as we're going to get uh, a, a very large diversity of different types of devices? This is a problem that, of course, exists also in computer graphics, which is what I started with. Um, creating high quality animations like the one that we see here is not something that anyone can do. You need a lot of skills, a lot of talent, and a lot of time. Um, but in computer graphics, a very active research topic is that of automating content generation. So here is an example of what I mean. This is a design system for animated characters that was proposed a few years ago. Um, and it provides a set of very intuitive tools that allow the casual users to create their own specific and personalized virtual characters. And underneath the hood, the software does a lot of the work that a professional artist would do in an automated fashion. Um, and as a testament to the success of such a design system, more than 180 million different designs have been uploaded to the database that is associated with this project. Right? So once you have the design tool available, people will use it and they will make their own creations. Um, and this is something that's just not possible if the design tools are not there because the, the learning curve is just too steep for the general public to undertake it. So inspired by this type of work, um, a research challenge that I think is very interesting is the following. Can we leverage computational models to make the task of designing robots easily accessible to everyone? Can we take this task that right now requires a lot of engineering uh, skill and knowledge and make it as intuitive, flexible, and approachable um, as this design system that I just was showing you is for creating virtual characters. And ideally what we want from such a design system is to uh, provide ample room for personalization while automating tasks that are too tedious or challenging. Um, over the past few years I've taken the first few steps to try to understand this problem and see how much can be done, and this is what I'm going to um, talk about today. Um, and I'll start by talking about automata, which are animated mechanical devices. They've been around for hundreds of years. And in the hands of a skilled designer, uh, the complex interaction between mechanical parts can produce really nice and compelling motions. Although these, of course, are not robots, definitely not in the sense that we're thinking about for, for modern robots, they are still very difficult to design, and you still need to have uh, both an artistic sense and also a lot of engineering knowledge before you can create something that is interesting. So with this first project I'll talk about, um, our goal was to develop a principled approach that allows casual users to design such mechanical characters. So I'll show you an example of how the interface works. The user starts by loading uh, an existing design for the mechanical character they want to animate. Then they specify the location is space where the gearbox or the mechanical components have to live. And after that proceeds to select a point on the character, draw a motion curve that indicates how this point should be moving. And our system, oops, our system then uh, automatically creates an optimized mechanical assembly that when you attach it to the character, it drives the motion of this point that was selected in a way that's as close as possible to what the user indicated. So we go from a high level speci specification of what the motion should be to a mechanism, which is exactly what an engineering would have to do with traditional methods right now. Um, the users can specify all aspects of the motion that they want to create in this way. And at the end, there are um, some simple tools, in this case, to change the phase offset between the different mechanisms. So basically, within a matter of minute and with very intuitive tools, you can start creating animations like this. And there are several other uh, steps that the system assists with to complete the design. So this is now a completely functional design that you can 3D print to have this animated mechanical character uh, in the real world. So I'll tell you a bit about how the system works um, underneath the hood. 
the input is consists of a character and motion curves that the user is specifying. The system then proceeds to automate the mechanism design process. And there are a few other steps to finish the design and make sure that it is printable. Uh, before I talk about the technical details, I'll just talk about the simulation model because it's actually tightly integrated. Uh, we assume that the entire mechanism is made of rigid components, which can be things like linkages and support shafts. They can be gears that transmit motions uh, or the individual parts of a character. Because they're rigid, all we have to do is uh, summarize their state using a position and orientation. And to control the relative motion between these different uh, components, we introduce a set of constraints. These are relatively standard in engineering. So exa for example, this is a pin connection. It ensures that the location of one pin on one component has the same world coordinates as a pin on the second component. Um, and to do this, we define a set of constraints that's just measuring the distance between these two points. And when the constraint is satisfied, the, the pin joint will be uh, valid. And now these two components can only move in a certain way relative to each other. And of course, we can have many different types of connections. Um, we can have a point on line connection that ensures that the pin on one component is restricted to lie on a line segment defined on another one. Uh, gear to gear connections that make sure that the relative motion between gears is correct, and so on. And what all of these connections have in common is that they output a set of constraints, of scalar constraints. So when we want to simulate a relatively complex mechanical assembly, we first collect all of the constraints into one big vector, and then we find the state of each component such that all of the constraints are satisfied. So the only thing that's now needed is to attach a virtual motor or a crank or something like that. Uh, and then through these constraints, the motion of this uh, actuator will be propagated throughout the entire mechanism. So now let's go back to the problem that we have to solve, uh, which if you remember is given a motion trajectory, we want to create an optimized mechanical assembly that reproduces this motion. There are many different ways in which you can think of approaching this problem. And for this project, what we assumed is that we have access to a library of parameterized mechanisms. This is the sort of thing that you can get by looking at a textbook of uh, mechanical engineering or, or mechanisms and figure out which uh, one of those which assemblies you want to use. Now, each one of these uh, mechanisms is parameterized. So by default, it might produce some motion. We visualize here the motion of the end effector. And as we're changing various mechanical parameters, such as the distance between these two gears, uh, or the length of the linkages, and, and various other parameters, you see how the motion changes with these, um, with these parameters. And so one thing that you can notice here is that the, these changes in motion are really not intuitive, which is why it's difficult to design by hand to begin with. So the problem that we then have to solve with this uh, parameterization is, given this motion curve, we have to figure out what type of mechanism from our library is best suited, and also what set of parameters we should be using for it. And we solve this in a two-stage process. For the first part, we build in an offline process a sparse database of representative motions for every type of mechanism that we have available. Uh, this is how we do it. You can think of any uh, particular type of mechanism as having a parameter space. Um, and so each configuration that, that we consider is a point in this parameter space. We start with an initial set of parameters. We generate randomly variations in the parameter space. And we evaluate the new uh, mechanism and its motion. Some of these mechanisms that we generate will, will be infeasible, so we can disregard them right away. And for the other ones, we want to keep them only if they add information that we haven't seen before. And so for this, we compare the end effector motion that gets produced with the mechanisms that we already have in the database. And if they're too close to each other, we assume that it doesn't bring any new information, so we can disregard it. And if it generates a novel shape, then we keep this uh, data point as well. And we recursively repeat this process, starting from the new data points that were added, until we no longer can add any new uh, samples. One thing that's important to note here is that the parameter spaces here are quite high dimensional. So for a fiber linkage, it's a 10-dimensional parameter space or so. 
So really, we can't sample this space too densely. It just doesn't scale. Um, and we have about 1,000 samples that we generate for every type of mechanism that we have access to. So the first thing that we do then when the user provides us with a sketch is we look in this database. And this tells us immediately what type of mechanism seems to be best suited for that motion. And it also gives us a good initial guess for the parameters that we need to use for it. But because we only use a sparse sampling of parameters, yes? Well, the elliptical shape is the motion, which is a function of the parameters. So the parameters would, would be things like, what is the length of the linkages, and where do they attach to each other? Um, so because we're using a sparse sampling of uh, the parameter spaces, the motion that we retrieve from the database is very likely not optimal. Uh, so we have an additional step, which is uh, based on continuous optimization, which compares the motion that we have as input with the motion that of the mechanism from the database. And we formulate an energy that looks at a distance between pairs of points along these two trajectories and attempts to, to further optimize the parameters of the mechanism such that th this distance is minimized. Um, and one thing that's technical but somewhat important is that we don't assume that these mechanisms that we work with have a closed form uh, solution that relates the motion that it produces with the parameters that it produces. And instead, we make use of the constraints, which are a very general concept, and we use the implicit function theorem to compute the uh, relevant gradient information. Um, another point that is uh, interesting here is to note the, uh, the sort of coupling between the database retrieval step and this continuous optimization. So they, they really work nicely together. Uh, the fact that we start with a good initial guess that we got from the database ensures that we're not going to get stuck in a bad local minimum. Uh, and at the same time, the fact that we can do continuous optimization on the parameters lets us get away with a very sparse sampling of the parameter spaces. Um, here is the process of optimizing a, a mechanism using a continuous approach. Because we start from a pretty good initial guess, uh, this optimization does converge very quickly, so we can still use it at interactive rates. Um, and here is another example that uh, shows the benefit of not assuming that we have a closed form solution for the mechanism. So the mechanism can be quite complex. In this case, we're specifying the motion, the target motion on an end effector that's quite far away in the mechanism space from where the parameterized mechanism is, but we can still uh, solve this continuous optimization problem. We also have a mechanism to allow the users to change the timing of the motion, which is important for animations. And for this, we use non-circular gears. Uh, the idea here is that while one of the gears moves at continuous angular speed, uh, the angular speed of the second gear will always be a function of the relative uh, ratio of the radii at the point at which the gears meet. So to control the shape of these non-circular gears, the user can specify the phase of one of the gears as a function of the phase of the other one. Or we can actually treat these control points as, op as parameters that we optimize for using the continuous optimization. Uh, this is an example that, that shows the uh, non-circular gears and how they're used. So here we wanted the motion of the feet to slow down in some part of the uh, gate and then speed up later on. And we can achieve this through these uh, non-circular gears. So at this point, what we have is a collection of uh, mechanisms that are all sort of separate and independent from each other. And if you wanted to uh, manufacture this result and have it move, you need to attach an actuator to each one of these mechanisms, um, which is perhaps OK for some applications, but we wanted to reduce the number of active degrees of freedom that are needed. So we let the users, uh, or the system is letting the users create gear trains that will couple the motion of all of these different mechanisms to each other. In general, this is a combinatorial problem. There are a lot of different ways of creating gear trains that will connect these existing gears. And we could have asked the system to try to solve this automatically, but then we'd have to deal with a very challenging problem. And instead, we rely on the fact that for humans, this might be an intuitive, or there, there might be an intuitive aspect of the problem that they can help with. Um, and in particular, what we have the user do is select pairs of gears that they think they should connect to each other. Uh, so I'll show you the example. Here it is. The, the users can select pairs of gears 
They press a button, and now the system tries to connect those two gears to each other. And it figures out if intermediate gears are needed and where to place them and how large they should be such that they all uh, mesh. And it's not difficult to extend this case for gears that are not in the same plane um, and, and so on. So it, it, this does show something that I think is quite important, which is we can't always rely on computers to do everything automatically. But if there's a, a subtask that people are good at, then they can have a meaningful interaction where they, they, they do help the, so, the software and the software helps them. Um, we've used this design system to create various examples. I'll show two of them here. Um, this one is interesting for two reasons. First of all, we put all the mechanisms within the body of the character. Conceptually, nothing changes, uh, but it does result in a more compact design. The other thing that I want to point out is that this example, this uh, device was 3D printed in one piece with all the moving parts already in place. So it's an example of something that cannot be fabricated with traditional approaches. Now, of course, there's also, there are also downsides. There are, there's a lot of friction in the system. There's also probably more play than we would want. But it does show sort of the promise that 3D printing holds. Not, it's probably not ready right now, but as, uh, as we make more advances in this field, I think it's only going to get better. When you say one piece, do you mean pre-assembled or? Pre-assembled. It came in one piece. We just had to remove the support material. And then you just crank it in? Yep. Yeah. What, what did you print? Did you reuse it to the end of this? Or yeah, so we had to create geometry for all the shafts, for all the gears, and we had to make sure there is enough clearance between them such that they don't fuse during the 3D printing process. And for the particular 3D printing technology we used, uh, it's about 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 millimeters of space that you want to leave between moving parts. And then the printer will not fuse them to, to each other. What about separation? And same, same sort of thing, so 0 0.3 millimeters of, of space between them. Uh, this example, I'll just play it again, uh, was our first attempt to create a walking automaton. Um, so with this project, we wanted to let the users specify the type of motion that they want to create. But of course, uh, an alternative is to start with an animated virtual character and try to create a physical representation for it. Um, so we had a follow-up project that was looking exactly at this problem, and we took a different approach. So we, we no longer uh, assume that we have a library of mechanisms that we can use, and rather we try to synthesize uh, linkage structures from, the, from scratch. So the input consists of a kinematic chain that is animated, um, and the design tool has to handle two types of problem. One is the, uh, the challenge of creating the linkage structure, both the topology and also the various parameters for it. Um, and the second problem that is very important when we're dealing with closed loop, uh, closed loop, no, closed kinematic loops is that singularities are a real problem. So we have to make sure that we stay uh, away from them. Uh, we address the problem, these two problems in two steps. One is a simplified view of the problem where we're just interested in creating a, a working topology for the linkage structure. And then we perform a global optimization to make sure that it's as close as possible to the input motion. For the first step, as I was saying, we start with uh, uh, a structure that is animated. And if you wanted to create something like this in the real world, you could. You, you would just basically have to put a motor at each one of those red joints and pass through the motor the trajectories that come from the animation. But this would be an expensive structure. It would be heavy, and there can be other types of problems. So our goal was to try to remove the active degrees of freedom and replace them with passive structures. And here's the key insight that we started from. If you have this motion, and then you're able to find on the top and bottom components a pair of points such that the distance between them doesn't vary at all throughout the motion, then what that means is that you can put a rigid link between those two points run the same motion, and then nothing bad happens. Now, if you're looking at what happens in this case, we're introducing one rigid component, which is planar. So we're adding three degrees of freedom to the system and two pin joints that remove four degrees of freedom. So technically, this is an over-constrained system. But the additional constraint that we've added is redundant. It doesn't conflict with anything that's already in the system. However, what this lets us do is remove one of the existing constraints. 
So we can take one of the motors and remove it. And now the motion of this button link, instead of being controlled by the motor, it will be controlled by this passive coupling that we've introduced. So we can remove it, and then it'll produce exactly the same motion. Now, I've said something which is, if we can find a pair of points such that the distance between them stays constant throughout the animation, well, in general, that's not going to be possible. So we can do the next best thing, which is find a pair of points such that the distance between them varies least throughout the motion. Uh, and the hope is that the smaller this variation in the distance is, the smaller the resulting change in the motion will be as we perform the replacement operation. Now, we do have to be careful here because um, what's happening is that the force that's acting through the link that we're introducing needs to apply a torque that will generate the motion for the bottom link. And to make sure that the relationship between this force and the torque is always well behaved, we need to add an additional constraint. Um, and in this case, we're adding a log barrier that makes sure that the area of this triangle uh, never goes to zero. If it goes to zero, that means that the moment arm goes to zero, and it means it doesn't matter how much force you're applying through the link, it's going to create a zero torque. So that's something that we want to avoid. Um, now, this formulation is very quick to solve. It doesn't require us to, um, to solve any of the kinematics. We just have to look at the, ind the individual parts of the motion. But it is non-convex, which means that it has many local minima, which in general is a problem, uh, but we try to use that to our advantage. And so what the system does, and I'll show you that in a second, is it solves the problem repeatedly by starting from diff different initial guesses. And then we do a gradient-based uh, search that takes us to the nearest local minimum. So I'll show you how we use this. The user specifies which pairs of links they would want to connect to each other through a passive coupling and which motor to remove. And our system solves the problem over and over again, starting from different solutions. And it presents the user with the best choices that it was able to find. And as you can see, there are many different uh, solutions. And, and they do look different, differently. And the motions they, pr they produce are different also. And so we let the user browse through these solutions and choose the one that they like best. And this way, they can also trade off some of the changes in motion with how nice the resulting structure looks. Um, this process then repeats over and over until the user is happy with how many active degrees of freedom are left in the system. So in this case, uh, there will be only one motor, which is at the top. And everything else is just a result of the complex interaction between the rigid links. Now, this replacement operation uh, only looks at the assembly in a sort of localized way, so we never actually look at the global motion explicitly. And as a result, it, it can certainly be improved. And so we run a global optimization step where we optimize the location of the joints, of all of the joints that, that the system introduced, to, to try them to match the input as closely as possible. More formally, um, we define an objective that looks at the quality of the motion, uh, a, a notion of how nice the resulting structure is, and also um, we have another term that makes sure we stay away from singular configurations. For the motion term, we simply look at the joint angles uh, of the original structure and the input throughout the entire animation, and we compare the difference between them. As a measure of how compact the structure is, we look at the distance between the location of the joints that were introduced and the original structure, and we're trying to minimize it. Um, and to avoid singular configurations, we are now looking at uh, singular values of the constrained Jacobian. And without going into too many details about it, um, the constrained Jacobian tells you how the value of the constraint is changing as you're changing the various states of the components. And if there's a singular value in it, that means there's a direction in state space along which you can walk, and it doesn't change any of the constraints. This means that the mechanism is not, the motion of the mechanism is not well defined at that point. So there are many configurations that still satisfy all the constraints. And that's a sign of a singular configuration. We want to avoid it. And therefore, we, are, uh, we have a log barrier that's making sure that the smallest singular value is always greater than some threshold. Um, and at the end, we have another uh, step, which is purely for aesthetic purposes, where we change the shape of the links without actually changing any of the location of the joints 
just to make it look a bit more organic. Uh, so visually it makes a big difference, but functionally it's exactly the same as before. So let me show you two results that we have with this method. This is the original animation that we, that we started from. Um, and these are the uh, linkage structures that we generated from the motion of the individual legs. And this is the fabricated prototype. So the legs here were, were 3D printed. The rest of it was kind of too large to, print, to fit in our print volume, so we had to Frankenstein it a little bit. Um, and here's another example. This one we didn't fabricate, but we still thought it was pretty interesting. We created three different structures. They're all planar, but then when you arrange them uh, such that they each operate in different planes, you obtain something that looks like this. So with these two systems, we can create mechanical automata that produce, uh, I would say, pretty interesting motion. And these motions are the result of a complex interaction between uh, mechanical components. But functionally, they're, they're quite limited. So they can, they can produce a periodic motion, but that's about all. Um, so we recently completed a different project where we were looking at walking robotic creatures. Um, and the goal here was to allow users to provide the system with a high-level description of the type of robotic creature that they want to create. And the system should aid as much as possible with creating these, uh, these, these robotic creatures. And in particular, we were interested in making sure that they can walk in a stable way without falling over. Um, so here, the uh, core of, of our system is a, a mathematical model that captures the relationship between the form or the shape of the robot and its functionality or how it should be able to move. So very briefly, this is how it works. We start with a description of the robot. So how many legs does it have? Where are the joints? Um, how large are the, the various links and so on? And then we optimize for uh, trajectories for the feet. Now, to make sure that these trajectories are feasible in some sense, we have to ensure that some constraints are satisfied. So in this case, we are making sure that, there, that the feet do not slip. For this, we need some additional information that tells us when the legs are supposed to be in stance mode or in contact with the ground and when they're supposed to be in swing mode. This is information that the user is providing, so I'll, I'll, tell, I'll talk a little bit about that later. We also compute a uh, trajectory for the center of mass of the robot. And again, we have to make sure that this trajectory is physically feasible. And to do this, um, we use a simplified model. This is an invariant pendulum model, which is quite common, to compute the center of pressure that explains the trajectory of the center of mass. Right? So it's looking essentially at an analysis of the forces that are acting on the system and make sure that the acceleration of the center of mass is explained by uh, the forces that are acting. Uh, so we can compute the center of pressure at any moment in time. And to make sure that the motion is then realizable, we make sure that the center of pressure lies within the support polygon. And mathematically, what we do here is we uh, make sure that the center of pressure can be expressed as a convex combination of the location of the feet that are underground at any moment in time. Um, and of course, we also optimize for full body motion trajectories for the robot. And we add constraints that make sure that uh, its center of mass and uh, foot motions match the trajectories that we were planning for. So we solve for all these variables at the same time uh, in order to, to create motions that are uh, feasible. Here's an example of a robot that we created with our, uh, that we designed with our framework. Um, all the body parts are 3D printed, and we're using off-the-shelf uh, motors and control boards, so, so those parts are all standard. Um, I was describing the set of uh, variables that we optimize for and the set of constraints that we need to enforce to make sure that the motion is feasible. And of course, there are many different motions that do satisfy all of those constraints. Um, and that lets the user specify high-level goals for the robot and also uh, personalize the motion style. So here is an example. Um, we have some sliders that allow us to specify the, the walking speed or the direction, uh, the turning angle, and so on. And you see how the, the optimization happens uh, at interactive rates. So we've tried really hard to make it uh, as efficient as possible, such that users can get uh, real-time, or at least almost real-time, 
preview of what the robot is going to look like uh, once it's fabricated. So as, as the user is providing these high-level goals, the optimization is figure, figuring out how to change the motion plan such that the, the goals get achieved as closely as possible. Um, this is an example where we show that the footfall pattern is also provided by the user. So the footfall pattern indicates the, uh, the gate that the robot should be using, and it provides the contact flags that then we have to use in the uh, optimization. So here's the robot that's now uh, executing various motions that were optimized. So all of those uh, work OK. This is another example where the user is changing the style of the motion. And here we're providing a target trajectory for the center of mass, uh, both positions and orientations throughout the motion. Um, and those are treated as soft objectives. So it's trying to get as close as possible to what the user is providing while still making sure that the constraints are satisfied. Um, with this design system, users can also change the structure of the robot that they want to create. And again, as they're making changes, they can immediately see a preview of what the robot would look like. Here's an example. Uh, we have standard tools for changing the dimensions of the robot. Uh, we can add new joints. In principle, we could add new legs. Um, and every time you make a change, the computer thinks for a little bit, tries to figure out how, how this particular robot should be moving now that you've changed it. And at the end, it comes up with a, a phys physically feasible motion for it. Um, the system also automatically generates the geometry that needs to be sent to a 3D printer. So again, the only thing that we assume as input here is the type of actuator that we're going to be using. Um, this, in principle, is a very general, um, general system, so we can just swap the, the motors depending on which ones we have available. And as we're changing the relative position and orientation between motors, the, the structure also gets regenerated such that uh, we can 3D print it and connect it to the motors. So I'll show two more examples that we created with the system. On the left, we, have, we see the simulations. And on the right, the physical robots that uh, follow the same motion and, and, generally speaking, behave in a pretty similar way. So with this design system, it takes uh, you know, half an hour or so to design a robot. And right now, um, probably a couple of days to 3D print the structure. So the fabrication process is, again, the bottleneck and not the design. Now, for all of these projects that I was talking about, we have an underlying assumption that the various structures are rigid and they don't deform. And in reality, that's not true. Even more so when we're fabricating things with plastics, uh, the, the assumption is definitely not true. Um, so we basically have two options here. Either we say, OK, well, we're, we're going to try to create a geometry of the 3D printed objects such that it deforms as little as possible. Or we can say, we know it's going to deform, so let's try to exploit that and, and leverage it in the design process. Of course, that's adding a lot more degrees of freedom, uh, but potentially it also makes the design space larger, so we can create even more interesting structures. Um, so I was involved in a project that was looking at exactly this problem. How can we leverage the elastic properties of uh, materials? And similar to the goal that we've had for the other projects, we start with an input that uh, the user is providing us. It, it could be something like the shape of uh, uh, an object or a character that we want to create, and some specification of how this object should be able to deform. And at the end, what we get is a, a recipe for how to fabricate this object. Um, now, of course, here the question is, how do we actuate this object? How do we make it uh, you know, achieve this shape? Um, and we assume that we have some way of actuating it, either by connecting cables to it and having a, a cable-driven puppet, or we can just uh, create pins that we just stick on a board, and they will provide boundary conditions. And then as a result of the forces that we're applying at these actuating locations, we want to control the way in which the object deforms. Um, and for this, we have uh, an optimization of the actual location uh, or actual placement. And also, we are doing a, an optimization of the material properties. And here, we're taking advantage of the fact that we don't have to be limited to created homogeneous objects. right? We can change the material parameters throughout the object in order to change the way in which it uh, deforms. At a very high level, um, we formulate this as another optimization problem. 
And here we, we have some abstract set of design parameters. They can be the uh, location at which we are uh, assigning the cables or material parameters. Um, we define an objective that tells us that the deformed configuration, once all the forces are acting on the object, needs to be as close as possible to the targets that the user is providing. And to make sure that we're getting a result that is meaningful, um, we are adding constraints that are saying that the, that the net force at any uh, place within the object has to be zero. So we're basically searching for a static equilibrium configuration. Um, so I'll just show you the process of doing this optimization. In this case, we're optimizing for placement of forces and also the value of the forces that need to be applied such that these objects then deform in the shape or in a, in a shape that's as close as possible to what the user provided. And once we have this, we can also do the optimization of the material parameters. Um, and here we use a typical finite element discretization. So we basically break these objects down into very small elements. There, there will be triangles in this case. And we're allowing the material parameters to change per triangle. Uh, ultimately, we wanted to decide, each triangle should decide if it should be soft or stiff. Um, and, and this is exactly what's happening throughout this process. And again, the goal is that the deformation of the objects as we're applying a set of forces matches as closely as possible the input shapes that were provided. For fabrication, there are several options. Uh, one option is to 3D print the rigid components and then uh, embed them into silicone. So that's, that's something that we've, uh, we've done for this example. So this, this is the result of the simulation versus the fabricated prototype. In this case, uh, we do have boundary conditions on the hands and, and some other parts of the body. But then the way the deformations get propagated through the um, entire structure is then a function of how the uh, object is designed. Here's another example uh, where we started with an input animation. And in this case, the actuator parameters were um, at the same time, the location where cables need to be attached to the object and also where they should be attached on this external rig, um, which controls then the direction along which the force is applied. And this is the physical prototype. Uh, the strings are not so easy to see, but they are there. Uh, for fabrication, we can also use multi-material 3D printing. So we did create one prototype with this. Um, this is the same type of uh, object that can, uh, a 3D printer that can create uh, either soft or rigid materials. And so for this, the input was a rest pose and a specification of what kind of range of motion we would want this uh, object to have. After the optimization, we figured out which parts should be stiff and which parts should be uh, soft. And this is the fabricated result. So the, the dark material here is, is quite rubbery. All right. Um, so now, if I was to go back to the slide which uh, shows the overall research challenge that I'm interested in, I would say that we're still quite far away from achieving it, although these first few steps I think are quite promising um, and at least are a proof of concept that it is possible that computational models can assist casual users such that they can create things that without them uh, would be quite difficult. Uh, but going forward, there are definitely a lot of different directions that I'm interested in. Uh, for example, right now, uh, for the design system for robotic creatures, we allow users to specify the motion style, but we would like them to be able to author uh, much richer behaviors and interaction modes. Um, I was mentioning that the 3D printing process is right now the bottleneck in, in terms of being able to create physical prototypes for these designs. Uh, so definitely looking at new manufacturing technologies or, or different manufacturing technologies is interesting. So we are looking, for example, at laser cutting as a way of creating uh, mechanical structures much faster. Um, the motions of the robots are also relatively slow right now. We would like them to be increasingly more agile. And as we do this, 
we are going to have to think more and more about feedback policies that work in real time and so on. Um, and also, I think then it's going to be much more interesting to, to look at the coupling between the materials that are used for the mechanical structures and how they affect the ability of the robot to perform the types of motions that we want them to perform. Um, we also would want to go from much higher level objectives to designs. So it would be nice if I said something like, I want to create a robot that looks like a teddy bear and it's uh, cuddly so I can interact with it, but it should also be able to go up the stairs in my house. Uh, so, so right now, basically the user would have to provide quite a bit of information in the structure of the robot and the, the, the number of legs, the kinematic parameters. Uh, so looking at the inverse relationship I think would be very interesting. Um, and also to make these devices increasingly smarter, we have to integrate more sensors, more actuation capabilities, and more computation abilities as well. Um, so just before I conclude, I wanted to say that the projects that I talked about, if you're interested, you can learn more by uh, looking at the uh, research papers. And I also want to acknowledge my collaborators on all these projects. And so I'm happy to take questions. I think it's a very interesting direction, yeah. And in particular, the compliant nature of the 3D printed parts is something that people haven't looked at so much yet, um, when it comes to 3D printing, at least. But yeah, when you're starting to think about compliant mechanisms, all of a sudden the design space grows very quickly. And so having some templates to start with is, sounds like a very good idea. Oh, no, th there were some. I, uh, so actually in the uh, Bernie example, which is the old robot thing, that we were using some uh, sliding constraints. It's really a function of which mechanism from the database seems to be best suitable for the type of motion that the user is indicating. Do you envision any of this scaling up? In one of your first slides, you have uh, exoskeleton on the side. It would be amazing if you could have a GIY printed. I think it's easy to envision uh, computational tools scaling to that, yes. Um, and in fact, I don't know if you've heard of the Unable initiative, which is uh, basically uh, volunteers making prosthetic devices for people in need. It's already an example of, um, at the very least, the, the thought process happening sort of in the wild. Uh, and I would say that computational design tools is what they're really missing most. Uh, and so all of the designs that they make have to be, you know, trial and error, many iterations. And these, these are actually not, um, or at least many of them are not professional engineers, right? So this is actually a perfect application domain for this type of work. Yeah. Are you uh, fostering some sort of a community of people that may exercise these tools? Uh, I am trying to work on a project where we're going to attempt to bring a simplified version of the first project to the Children's Museum to allow uh, kids to get involved in STEM activities through personalized content that they create. So I think an interesting question there is, uh, from a learning point of view, is it the case that if we create the design tools that, that, that let kids be creative instead of you know, just using kit that someone else designed, will that be better uh, in terms of the 
incentive to learn or the, uh, the outcome of the process. So definitely we are pushing also in that direction. Uh, I know that one of your objectives is trying to let people that um, aren't roboticists design robotic um, figures or motions. And um, it seems to me that sometimes when we try to like make uh, design tools more more accessible to non-technical users, sometimes we also end up making tools that could be useful for technical users too. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Have you ever thought about kind of hybrid systems that where you could, you know, have like, computational models help get uh, most of the way there, or and have like a uh, engineer? go back in and play with some of these parameters, so it just saves us a lot Well, definitely the output of our system is something that you, you could then load into a traditional CAD package and then further refine it, if that's what you want. Um, and so it's true that I, I do talk a lot about casual users, because I think from a research challenge, that is basically the ultimate goal. If we're able to solve that problem, then we can definitely scale back in terms of how much the system does between nothing and everything. Um, I, I also think that tools like this will help professional users iterate faster, uh, perhaps design more complex things that they could without it. So that's certainly within scope as well. We haven't considered it in this work, but it's definitely something that needs to be done uh, before you were able to you know, ship this as an app that people can use. Um, and there definitely are people in the community that are looking exactly at this. So how much variance is it between different devices? Um, how do you design something specifically for a given device? So the easiest version of this would be to change tolerances and so on, but perhaps the geometry also needs to be uh, changed. It's a big, it's a big problem, and yeah, it needs to be solved. Yes. Uh, this, might, uh, this question might be the same as Alan's um, question, but do you have a uh, system which is more complex and complicated, more parts, more larger, and then your error levels will be amplified or propagated? So in that case, in your design, do you have any plan to include that error? Uh, error well, there are various types of errors. So some of them could be because of play. Uh, some of them could be because of deformations. So for deformations, or actually for, for both kinds of errors, you could try to increase the modeling accuracy, and then you don't have to propagate errors, but rather it'll be the, the result of the simulation model that you have. Um, it does need to be done, I guess, but it doesn't make the problem any simpler. So for, for this type of work, uh, we also want to keep the systems interactive. And the reason for this is because sometimes some aspects of the design are perhaps too difficult, and that's where the user might be able to help. Uh, and in other parts of the design process, we just want the user to be able to be creative and, and create the type of thing that they want. Um, and so then it becomes a uh, trade-off between how much um, modeling accuracy you want, and if that comes at the expense of computation complexity, you know, how do you balance the two such that you can still have an interactive design system? Yes. 